Welcome to today's webinar, Closing the Care Gap. I'm Jenna Wessenberg with Health Check 360. We have a great presentation for you today, but before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. We will have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them into the question box in the lower portion of your control panel. We will also be posting a recording of the webinar online, so if you'd like to replay this at a later date, it will be available. Also, if anyone would like a copy of the presentation, please send an email to me or type your request in the question box. Today we have Chris Lambert and Jessica Mando with us to talk about how you can go beyond wellness programs and use some alternative approaches toward medical management to support employee health. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Jessica. Thank you, Jenna. As far as an agenda that we are going to walk through today, um, talking about is wellness enough? So what we mean by that is there's definitely a need for a wellness program and proactively identifying risks within the population. Um, but really we're going to talk through today some ways that we can go beyond the wellness initiatives and provide different options to help reducing your health care spend on your plan. Um, and then in addition to that, the items that you need to think about when choosing a partner. And so what, not just what the solution looks like, but who's going to be the best fit for your organization. Wellness is important, as I mentioned. It helps us to proactively identify risks within the population, provide early detection for individuals, really arming them to be able to understand what those health risks are and what they can do about it. Um, in addition to that, it really allows us to change behavior and focus on lifestyle and enhancements um, before it becomes a chronic condition or a larger issue. Um, but there's so much more that we can do to help reduce gaps in care and assist members in navigating the healthcare system. Looking specifically at just medication statistics and medication noncompliance, out of the 100% of prescriptions that are filled, or excuse me, that are prescribed, out of 100% of the um, scripts that are prescribed, only 88% of them are filled. Out of those that are filled, only 76% are taken. And then only 47% are refilled as prescribed by their physician. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity, not just on the medication side, but how that impacts compliance with care, uh, health care spend, and just overall quality of life for members. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris Lambert to discuss more specifically on the areas that uh, you can take a look at to help with reducing gaps in care and uh, impacting your medical spend. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so just to frame our conversation, a quick overview um, of some of those strategies that uh, we certainly employ here and that we think will impact your member population. So the very first uh, vertical would be just managing where care happens. Uh, we certainly know that, you know, there's some preference sensitive conditions that occur. Uh, members may start in a particular setting, uh, but we don't want them to linger there past the point when, you know, we really have benefits. So we're looking at inpatient care, outpatient care. Is home the best place? Uh, should infusions happen uh, in a hospital-based facility? Those types of things. We also want to look at referral management and, and those individuals who might be leaking outside your preferred network. Um, and as I mentioned, infusion services. And then in that center vertical, um, the importance of primary care uh, is really across all of our programming. We, we know very clearly from research that if we can keep people engaged with their primary care provider, they're going to cost your health plan less, uh, on average between 20 and 30 percent. So that primary care piece is really key, um, not only in the relationship between member and provider, but in helping us close those gaps in care. Uh, going back to Jess's point on the medication adherence, really um, having an impact in that arena because, again, we know that um, the provider influence and in making sure people understand and adhere to meds is key. And then, of course, preventive care so we can look at um, controlling costs in the future. The last vertical is really looking at your members who already have some type of, of complex condition. Um, we have large case management. Um, we certainly can't forget that space of individuals in the middle who have complex medical issues but perhaps haven't moved into the high dollar space yet. We want to make sure they don't do that. Um, and then there's a real opportunity around second opinion services to make sure um, that not only are people receiving the correct diagnosis, but then once diagnosed that they receive the correct treatment. 
so let's talk a little bit about the clinical approach. Um, and I would, I'd like to start um, with the chronic care piece. You know, in our world, we really think that data drives um, all of our decision making. Uh, not only does it identify the correct member population, but it's also going to um, target that expensive RN resource on the right population. We also think it's very key to include the right data. So getting that mix of claims information, the biometric um, data from our wellness partner, and then making sure that we can look at things like um, office visit, ER, inpatient, prescription, and blending all of that together. We certainly adhere to evidence-based care recommendations. I think that's um, important just to call out. You know, our programs aren't based on an opinion. They're, they're based on research and what types of care have the largest impact. Um, just started out our conversation today talking about medication adherence. I can't overemphasize the importance of that. If we can keep people taking their medications, we're going to keep them out of the emergency room. Uh, we'll keep them out of the inpatient setting, uh, and they should have fewer complications as well. And as I alluded to, that targeted RN engagement, we believe, is key in making sure that the right members get the right engagement at the right time. So in our world, we currently target eight conditions. Um, we have under the umbrella of respiratory, asthma, and COPD. Really the focus in the asthma world is making sure that your members, again, are engaged in primary care and not utilizing the ER space for their um, just episodic needs. We want to make sure they're well controlled. Uh, somewhat similar in the COPD space. Um, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time talking about uh, diabetes and the fact that it has become something of an epidemic in our world. Um, so those members uh, certainly can be high dollar on your health plan, so we want to um, get to them early. Heart failure um, has high potential for costs in the inpatient setting. And then under the umbrella of coronary artery disease, um, we want to work with our folks who have hypertension, high cholesterol, who have known cardiac um, issues, we would make sure we have an RN uh, focused on their care. And then our newest program is around chronic kidney disease. Um, we certainly know the expense that uh, an end-stage renal member on dialysis can create within a health plan. So if we can find those individuals when they're early in their disease progression um, and hold them there at stage three or four before they become your next dialysis patient, um, that's the aim of that um, final program. So I mentioned earlier targeting our resources. Um, we're going to use the, the biometric data, the claims piece, both medical and Rx, to do that first run through and, and identify who our population is. Um, and then the next step for us is really risk stratifying those individuals to look for things like um, high utilization, emergency room visits, inpatient stays. Uh, Going back to our biometrics, we're going to look for um, A1Cs that are high, blood pressure readings that are high, uh, cholesterol panels. And then we're going to um, divide our members into two groups. We're going to say these folks are compliant with care, these folks um, have gaps in care or medication adherence issues. If you're compliant with care, um, you know, we don't want to overburden those members, but we don't want to lose sight of them either. So they're going to have a more limited RN intervention model. Uh, but we do stay in contact with them at least quarterly, uh, send them reminders about upcoming appointments, uh, and again, make sure they're getting uh, the appropriate preventive care. It's the non-compliant members that we're really going to target the RN team uh, to engaging. And then we also risk stratify that population one more time to see who has ER and inpatient use. Uh, we're certainly going to try and engage them on a more frequent basis so that we can address those issues as well. We also do try to match um, our members to the appropriate staff skill set. So, for example, um, our individuals who have a high A1C or poor diabetic control are going to go to our certified diabetic educator. We have asthma, certified asthma educators. We have staff who are focused on cardiac. Um, and I call that out just as a matter of course to say that, you know, certainly we want to make sure that the member is matched to the right um, individual so they have the highest chance of success. 
So how do you engage members? That's really the secret sauce, I think. Um, and it starts from uh, the very beginning when we bring on a new client all the way through uh, ongoing campaigns to make sure that we stay in front of those um, members on the plan and those who are um, currently enrolled. So effective onboarding is important. Um, scheduled communications, we need to find the member where they want to be found. So if that's telephonic, that's great. If it's email, if it's a push notification, texting, snail mail, but um, we certainly recognize that a one size doesn't fit all for our members. Uh, we believe strongly that incentivizing participation is key to making progress on closing gaps in care. Um, and within our book of business, we've um, got some good information that clearly demonstrates that um, plan premiums seem to be the most impactful but we have clients trying a variety of strategies. Um, again, just trying to find what that best mix is within the culture of their um, employee population. We do have some uh, who do co-pays, so they may do a medication co-pay or an office visit co-pay uh, at, at no cost share for the member if they're compliant. Um, deductibles, health savings account contributions, so there's, there's a variety of strategies. Uh, we certainly um, target online content through the Health Check 360 website uh, for our members. Uh, I talked about um, being proactive by using our data, so we're going to look at claims triggers and outreach to members. Uh, I think integration is important, um, so we um, have solutions where we can integrate our monitoring devices, um, which then generates, you know, an, a, a touch from a clinical team. Uh, we can bring in um, things like free testing supplies. And so uh, really the, the, the goal is to customize it again to the culture of the population and really look at where our needs are in terms of where we're we seeing uh, either gaps or high dollar spend so that we can address that with those members. And then I always like to mention the spouses. You know, there's always somebody in the household who's kind of the CEO of healthcare, and that tends in our world to be the spouses. Um, and so it's really important to bring the spouses into your campaigns as far as uh, targeting them for additional direct mail, email. Um, there's the opportunity to do some challenges for them or additional incentives, but spouses are key. So we've talked at a high level about condition management. Um, we also have advocacy solutions, and, and I I think if you, uh, you know, step back and, and look at the population we're serving, you know, our patients don't speak medical, they don't speak insurance, and so the advocacy program really is set up to help them navigate from point A to point B, and so that they're getting the necessary care at the right time in the right setting. Um, you know, we pride ourselves on being a very high-touch, hands-on uh, company. Um, we believe, and this isn't lip service, we absolutely believe that member experience is a key driver of outcomes. So if, if your teammate has a poor experience, they're not going to come back, and nor are they going to listen to the messaging that you know we want them to hear. Uh, we're very flexible. Um, as, far, as far as service, we like to customize programs. Again, just with the members, there's no one-size-fits-all, and with our clients, there's not a one-size-fits-all either. We work with a lot of different payers. We work with a lot of different PBMs, so we consider ourselves to be agnostic when it comes to plans and PPOs. And as I said, you know, the why advocacy, it really is true that, you know, our, our membership really has trouble just navigating from point A to point B. We want to make sure that they get the right care at the right time, and we know that they influence the care that they get in the world of preference-sensitive conditions. So. Um, we certainly want them to be coming to us as a resource and as an advocate for them as they move through the system. So in our advocacy programs, as I said, you know, we're going to help them find the right provider in network. We're going to get them to second opinion services depending on their diagnosis. We're going to work with them in those shared um, in the arena of shared decision making for those pre preference sensitive elected procedures. So an example of that would be um, if you have uh, somebody looking at a total joint replacement, are there alternatives to that? If 
you have a female who's thinking about having a hysterectomy, that's a preference sensitive condition. You know, can we talk to that individual um, in both those scenarios about the pros and cons, the treatment alternatives, what the risks are, benefits, and and oftentimes we know that simply by having that conversation, um, we can um, decrease your rate of total joint replacements and decrease your rates um, for those elective procedures. We also do pre and post discharge calls. Um, we certainly want our members to be well armed with um, the information they need before they enter the hospital. So if there's home modifications, if they need to have resources set up before they go in, um, that all goes toward helping prevent readmissions on the back side. Um, I mentioned preventive care notifications earlier on. That's important. You know, we have busy lives and those are easy things to lose track of. And then we um, also will coordinate with any external vendor services that our clients have. So you've heard me use the phrase right care at the right time, I think, throughout the presentation. You know, pre-certification in our world really is about right care, right time. It's not about denials. Uh, we certainly do deny care if it's inappropriate, but it really is about making sure the patient gets the appropriate treatment in the appropriate setting. Our pre-cert requirements can be flexible and customized to whatever unique environment that our clients have. We certainly do recommend that some um, services be looked at for pre-cert, and the reason why is those are the things that are going to drive our case management referrals. So inpatient admissions, um, I do have a note here that we include OB, which I think is a little bit different than other vendors. The reason we do is we want to make sure that we get the high-risk OB and, and potential preemies on the radar early and not wait for a call from the facility after the baby's already been in for three weeks. So um, there is a method to that madness. Um, MRIs, CAT scans, PET, PET scans, those are going to help us know our oncology, oncology cases early, excuse me, um, radiation, chemotherapy. Um, the reason we do include home health and DME is it just implies to us a more, more complex discharge plan. So those are members we like to look at um, for potential case management referrals. Again, with our, as with our um, chronic care programming, we're going to be utilizing evidence-based guidelines to do our reviews. And the other unique piece is that we do have an all-RN staff um, completing our pre-certifications, and we don't do auto approvals based on codes. I think that's important. We two standpoints. Number one, you're going to get more information and you're going to make a better decision. But number two, it helps build that library of information on, on your members so that if at a later time you, know, you need some assistance with either stop loss marketing or um, if we're just trying to, again, get the big picture of the patient and guide hand. Um, we also recognize that we do have limitations. I have two medical directors on staff, um, but you know, they can't be board certified in all specialties. So we use um, a company called MRILA for our external reviews so that we can match up. Uh, for example, if we have a lengthy inpatient psych stay, we're going to send that out to um, you know, board certified psychiatrist. Um, all of our transplants go to a board certified transplant surgeon. So certainly we recognize our limitations, but we've put in place um, partners who can help us with those needs. You know, another part of the utilization management as well as just complex care and case management is making sure we can address readmissions. Um, and so we, have, I mentioned earlier, we do pre and post discharge calls. Um, we also in our analytics, we're going to be out looking for you know, individuals that perhaps weren't calling into pre-cert but are still utilizers and use that information to make sure that we have an, an RN assigned to follow up with that individual. You know, we'll look at things like uh, lengthy inpatient stays. We'll look at do they come in through the ER? Were they in the ICU? Do they have a lot of comorbids? All of those things are going to drive uh, the length of engagement um, from the RN team with that particular individual. And really the initial call, the goal is to make sure they have that two-week survival information to make sure they don't readmit. Um, did they get new scripts? Did they fill the scripts? Are they now taking the medication? Do they have follow-up appointments, and do they have a ride to get there? Um, and then, again, just making sure we're a resource for those individuals. So we believe that's an important outreach activity. Uh, case management, I certainly alluded to the, uh, case management on a couple of other slides, but 
I think the difference in our case management approach is that um, we do have standard triggers, but not all case management referrals need to be high dollar. Um, sometimes the case complexity is what drives the referral. Um, and then we certainly encourage all of our HR teams to let us know if they have an individual who contacts them that just needs help getting from point A to point B and a little extra TLC to navigate the system. We feel like those are important for two reasons. Not, not only is it great PR for the health plan, but um, we're also going to reduce costs in, in the long term by avoiding duplication of services. And so um, we like to know about those individuals. I mentioned earlier we, different levels of care. We do um, work with not only the catastrophic, but also those folks who have complex medical needs. And once engaged with case management, my team becomes the one point of contact for pre-cert care coordination, education, treatment. We're the liaison with the claims payer um, benefit questions. So um, we really do become that one uh, stop shop for those members. And we know that case management does produce measurable savings. Um, cost containment, you know, I started out talking about cost containment. I just want to mention briefly that we do have some other solutions. Um, we do have a national network of doctors and facilities. Uh, I like to liken this to kind of like the price line of the medical world. So Priceline goes out and buys up excess capacity at hotels and this particular service goes out and contracts with outpatient uh, surgical centers to buy up their excess capacity. And so they offer us bundled pricing um, that can create some significant savings for your clients. Um, they also have a, a, a second solution around pharmaceuticals. Um, I will mention that that does require travel. Um, and the individual will be sent either to the Cayman Islands or to San Diego with a trip across the border into Mexico to be able to obtain the discounts on those um, pharmacy. Um, just a little bit more detail on the specialty drug solution. Um, this solution actually started out in the hep C world, but at this point it covers a whole host of um, disease states and medication types. Really the, the first look through somebody's pharmacy claims is going to be to identify those um, drug spends over $5,000. Um, the all-inclusive solution actually, I mentioned they have to leave the country to obtain the medication, uh, so it includes their travel costs, it includes if we need assistance with passports, it includes lodging, um, and there's a variety of incentives that can be bundled into that pricing to uh, entice members to uh, actually travel for that service. Um, but again, it is out of country, but I, I just want to note it is, they are accredited facilities. Our facility we contract with in the Caymans is part of Ascension Health. Um, so certainly the quality is there and um, there's not a concern with that travel. Uh, this is just some examples of the types of medications that we would be um, targeting. You know, certainly, if you have somebody, and I apologize, I see there's a typo on the far right, that should be Advait. Um, so that would be a, a hemophilia medication. Um, you can save for your clients $150,000 you know, every three months. So um, there's certainly opportunity here. We also have the um, capability of if you have questions about specific medications or if um, we have the opportunity to run your drug spend through the profiler, we can come back and let you know what we think your actual um, or your potential savings would be in this space. But these are just some examples. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so where do you go from here? I uh, want to talk to you a little bit about choosing a partner and some things that you should keep in mind. So. Chris had mentioned a couple of times a high-touch, hands-on approach. Your company and your health plan are all unique. You have different uh, needs for your employees and your culture within your organization is different from a lot of other organizations. And so finding a partner that's flexible and can really create a custom solution for your members I think is one of the most important things for you to take into account is what are your goals for the program? program, what unique needs do you have, and then can you find a partner who will make the best partner in order to be able to accommodate um, those things that are on your need list. 
we need to be mindful as far as how we communicate with members. So Chris had also mentioned that the experience of the, what the members are uh, provided from their program and from the partner that you choose is extremely important because as we all know, employees talk to each other. Um, and so that piece is really important as far as how you communicate the value of the program, um, what we're going to provide and the benefits and that kind of thing. So the perception of the program and how it's communicated is extremely important. Um, Making sure that there's an in-house customer service team. So because there are a lot of different moving parts for each program and because you want your program to be customizable, uh, having a in-house in the U.S. customer service team I think is really important to be able to answer those questions real time and quickly for, for patients um, so that, again, from an experience level, they're being provided the highest quality experience. We also want to share that this isn't going to be the best solution for every company, and it's not always going to work depending on the carrier that the company works with. And so those are just a couple caveats that we are plan and PPO agnostic. However, in certain carrier models, they may or may not let us carve out case management. It may or may not make sense to overlap different condition management programs, um, billing for the specialty surgery and drug solutions might be uh, a little unique. So just know that this isn't a one-size-fits-all and that there are um, specific things that we'll need to take a look at group by group, depending on what carrier they have, the plan they have, those types of things. And then looking at um, the program from a cost standpoint, so one of the things that we do internally is um, typically our billing is on a PEPM basis. So you have predictable costs. You know exactly what all of this is going to cost your plan versus on an hourly basis or per case review, those types of things. Um, so just know that uh, from a cost standpoint, that's something that you'll want to take a look at. Um, but after all this, you might be thinking, where do I start? Where do I go from here? What do I do? And my first suggestion would be, if you don't know whether or not you have some of these services with your carrier or your TPA, talk with your benefits consultant, um, go to your carrier and see if this is something that you are paying for. And in a lot of cases, it is embedded on a self-funded basis um, into your premiums that you're paying. And so that'll be something that you want to take a look at is, are you paying extra for some of these? What value are you getting from it? What type of results are you seeing? So I highly encourage you to ask your um, carrier or TPA for the reporting for any one of these programs. And what I mean by reporting, and I'll use condition management as an example, is a lot of times they'll provide you with a report that tells you how many times they've reached out. So how many members are qualifying as having diabetes or hypertension or some of the other conditions, and then how often that they've reached out to individuals, how many people they've gotten a hold of, and so on. But what those reports are missing is actual compliance rates. What are they, not just are they doing the work that they should be doing, but what types of results are they seeing from that? Of the individuals that they are able to get a hold of, are they compliant with care? Are they managing their condition? Are they taking their medication? Things that we know um, can help the member from a quality of life standpoint, but also uh, provide significant savings to your health plan. So I highly, can, uh, I highly encourage you to take a look at those types of reporting from um, your carriers and, and just make sure that you know what you're paying for and what you're getting for that. Um, and then ask the questions of, if is this something that we can put with an outside vendor? And then go from there as far as how to choose a partner that's going to make the most sense for you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jessica. And just to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type those into the question box in your control panel, and we'll get to as many of those we can in the time that we have. So we do have a few questions already. Um, first question, uh, why do we limit our focus to disease, eight disease states to manage? Um, why aren't other disease states included? Right, I think that's a great question. And, you know, we do continue to look at additions. Um, so the eight current disease states um, aren't necessarily those that may be in place, you know, at the end of 2019. Um, one that's um, 
one request we receive fairly frequently would be, do we have a separate obesity program and or a separate depression program? And we tend to weave those um, into the curriculum of the other programming simply because they're so prevalent. So within the diabetic space, the cardiac space, you know, a lion's share of our members have either weight issues or some other comorbid condition. Um, we know that depression is a very common comorbid condition within the chronic care space, so we tend to move that into the programming for those other conditions. Um, but again, we are um, certainly evaluating what our other options are. Also, perhaps maybe a little bit different, um, I know some vendors will do a separate like rheumatoid arthritis program. We handle that under our complex medical uh, bucket. So the programming may, that you're interested in may be in place, but it might be titled somewhat different than condition management. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Um, so how do you integrate these programs with your existing benefit? Can you please give us some examples? So uh, just to be clear on the question, um, so how do I integrate with existing programming, I think is what I'm being asked. Um, so I mentioned that working with other vendors, we certainly are happy to do that. Um, and it would be one of our goals when we bring on new clients. We do work with a variety of carriers uh, and TPA partners. You know, we have um, relationships in place with you know, Blues across the country. We have Anthem, Aetna, a variety of regional carriers. Um, so my team has become very adept at navigating different benefit plans, different benefit structures. Um, when we set up a new client, what we would ask for um, is we certainly want to get familiar with their SPD and their plan doc. Um, we want to know who their external vendors are, like EAP vendors, telemedicine. Um, with some of our carrier partners, we have integrations with their case management team. Uh, so we certainly are open to a variety of models and how that's structured. Um, and, and again, it's, it's somewhat unique to each individual client depending on what they already have in place. The other thing I would add to that is um, it's kind of a, a piggyback off what Chris mentioned. So I think Health Tech traditionally has been known as just a, a health and wellness uh, or well-being company. And we do have all these other arms of services that not all clients add on, um, but we can also provide them as a standalone offering. So if you're a company that has a different wellness service or, um, you know, is is just looking at implementing a diabetes management type of program, those are things that you can a la carte kind of pick and choose what makes the most sense for your company. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question, my carrier already includes disease management programming. Should I just use that program? I think that's certainly a question that we hear fairly frequently. And as I mentioned a minute ago, we work with a lot of different um, payers and payer partners within that whole BUCA space. And um, the reason why it works, um, we're not shutting off their disease management program, but what we've learned over the years is that they do it poorly enough that we really don't intersect um, with their disease management team very frequently. Um, but we recognize it can happen. And so what we do in our messaging to the member is we certainly communicate very clearly with them what our role is um, and that they could potentially be contacted by, by uh, for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. Perhaps they would be contacted by them. But if there's an incentive in play, you know, it's, it's our team that's managing the incentive and is the contact person um, for that particular program. Um, as I said, though, um, we tend not to engage one another very frequently, and, and I think that's um, a statement about the quality of their programming. Um, also being somewhat familiar with their reporting, they're going to talk to you about um, letters that went out, calls that were made, but they really don't and currently aren't reporting out to you what the outcomes of all of that activity is, which I think is a key uh, distinguishing feature of our program as well. Chris, one of the questions that I get often is, can we carve out condition management, case management, and some of those things? So what have you seen to be um, what's worked? And, and maybe the answer is it varies by carrier yeah. or company. I think it, um, it does vary. Um, we, we often hear in the blues space that if you um, shut off condition management with the blues, you're going to turn off case management, um, which we're very happy to handle 
you know, case management and condition management for our clients. Um, but oftentimes, then you have to make a decision about how are you going to handle your pre-certification process. And um, some carriers aren't willing to let go of that particular piece. And, and so we do have some Cigna clients, for example, that we do the case management and the condition management, but Cigna is doing the utilization management. So there's a variety of models out there. And, and really, if a client is interested, we need to dig into finding out what latitude we have. Okay, great. Uh, so it looks like we have one final question here, unless anyone types something in. In the meantime, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit more about what employers can expect with regards to ROI? So looking out from the date of implementation, um, what, do we, what do you expect for ROI from these types of programs and solutions? Yeah, so this is always the million dollar question, right? Return on investment. And I think that there are some programs that you 100% can show a cost savings. So we had mentioned the specialty drugs and surgical centers and, and some of those um, centers of excellence that we have partnerships with. And that's something where if you give us a list of your high cost um, drugs on your plan, then we can match that up to what we can provide down in the Cayman Islands or offshore and provide you an exact idea of what it would cost by sending those members out of the U.S. versus what they're paying for those drugs in the U.S. And, and that's an exact uh, idea of, of what the difference in cost would be and what those savings would be. Um, the return on investment and value on investment, th those questions are hard to answer on the wellness side and on the condition management uh, and some of the case management sides because if it's hard to tell you what we would have saved not knowing what would have happened to that member if, if certain initiatives were in place. We can't uh, predict a heart attack. We can't tell you if we prevented something from happening, but we do know that individuals that are compliant with care, that are changing their lifestyle, that are doing the right things, do cost the plan less. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that say that the disease management piece is a three to one return on investment. Again, it's it's hard to prove those actual dollars and cents in there, um, but know that if we can help get individuals compliant with care and focused on that today, tomorrow, the next day, that's going to be significant savings immediately um, versus some of the wellness initiatives and the other things are more how do we help individuals prevent risks from happening tomorrow, five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. Um, so I know that's kind of a, a vague answer, but um, it's just a really hard thing to actually quantify. And we're the type of company where if we can't show you exact dollars and cents and how we got there uh, and the formula, and if, you know, we're not going to just throw out random numbers. Okay, great, perfect. Thank you so much, Jessica and Chris. I do want to remind you that all attendees will receive a follow-up email with links to the presentation recording and contact information. This concludes today's webinar. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe to our blog and follow us on social media for the latest on Health Check 360. Have a great day.